Hello humans, meme lords and ladies, Pepe enthusiasts, social signalers, and Nicolas Cage worshippers, and welcome to the Good Timeline podcast. The place where we examine the world through the lens of transhumanism and adapting to a wild future. I'm your host, Ryan Ferris, and today's episode is with Don Cordwell, the managing editor of the popular cultural archive Know Your Meme. Memes are becoming ever more pervasive and powerful, and if you're intrigued by the strange global culture of the internet, then I'm sure you'll enjoy yourself with this chat. I'm now back in Europe for a few months and have been busy amongst the rebrand. Episodes coming up include an extended chat with Mike and Yuvi from the Future Thinkers podcast, Gul Dolan, who conducted research with octopuses and MDMA, a music podcast with my good friends Alex and Quaylen who are incredible folk musicians based in Prague. An extensive review of the risks and benefits of marijuana and legalization, because we may be coming up to legalization in New Zealand very soon. And a chat, which I'm going to conduct tomorrow with Jeremy Sherman, who is the author of Neither Ghost Nor Machine, a book which explores how aims and purpose may have emerged within life on Earth. So keep an eye out for those episodes. And in the meantime, enjoy this chat with the venerable meme lord himself, Don Cordwell. Well, Don, firstly, thank you very much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. You're very welcome. So, let's start at the basics. What is a meme? So, uh, yeah, it seems like that would be a really easy answer to that question, but it's actually a little bit more complicated than a lot of people think. Um, the way the word meme is often used today is when people are kind of referring to funny pictures on the internet or, or funny just jokes in general on the internet, right? But uh, the word was actually coined in 1976 by Richard Dawkins. He's an evolution it was an evolutionary biologist, that was what he was known for back then. Today, he's kind of known as like a prominent atheist figure. He uh, published his book called The Selfish Gene back in 1976. And the book kind of goes into just natural selection in general and uh, how altruism evolves. And when he was, you know, kind of trying to illustrate the way that natural selection works, he brought up the concept of evolutionary Darwinism. And he brought up that Evolution and natural selection occurs whenever something replicates itself. And to illustrate this point, he, he you know, talked about ideas replicating through human brains and came up with the word meme to be this like cultural analog to a gene. So the idea is that ideas that can spread from person to person also undergo natural selection because they're replicating and some of them are going to replicate more than others and they're going to fill up the the meme pool uh so yeah a meme is a very <laughs> kind of a complex idea when you when you get down to it definitely and while that often seems like it's sort of in a more um non-physical space the interesting thing about memes and also about things like music call them in, in German earworms when you get a song stuck in your head or a melody stuck in your head. The interesting, right, right. Th- interesting thing about that is, is it is physical, right? So like if you hear an idea through your auditory passage through your, your ears, that's actually creating some sort of physical mechanism which is forming your memory. So it is, it is like a physical thing happening much like Darwinism, you know, much like natural selection is happening in the, in the physical world. It's just more obvious, but it's kind yeah, of interesting, right? Yeah, I think right? that... Yeah, yeah, it's super interesting. Interesting, And I think that, like, you know, once we have the technology to start kind of visualizing what a memory is, right, I think people might have a different idea of, of how memes work. 
for now they seem so nebulous and so yeah like you know ethereal or just like you know mm. it's hard to not they don't seem physical right like you said mm. and i think that that's mostly due to the limits of our current technology and you know being able to nail down exactly what's going on with things like memory yeah so what role does know your meme play in culture so yeah no Know Your Meme has a really interesting role to play, I think. So my role at Know Your Meme is the managing editor. I've been doing this for you know nearly a decade now. What we do is we you know have these kind of Wikipedia style articles that will explain the whole life cycle of a meme, pretty much. So we kind of the approach to the meme is as if it's kind of like this this thing that's alive that was you know birthed into the world and then spread out so the structure of a know your meme article on a meme is that you know there'll be an about section giving a brief rundown on on what the meaning behind it is like what what is the basic description of the meme and then we immediately go into its origin and that's where you know if we can nail down where this thing came from like you know uh, the the site of origin we'll we'll put that in there and then the spread section will explain how it kind of proliferated how it, how it you know exploded across the internet um, what platforms it went to what tweets were big with with spreading it out you know what big amplifiers there were what Reddit posts that sort of thing um, so yeah the the role we play is that we document the history of a meme and how it became a cultural phenomenon. And your colleague Brad Kim said in an interview that meme culture is a mirror held up to the culture of the internet, which increasingly does not care about the truth and cares only about the narrative, the myth. Do you think you could ex- <laughs> add or expand uh, upon that statement? I mean, yeah, that was, in terms of meme culture being a mirror to the internet, I think that that's quite accurate. I mean, it's a meme culture is 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 the zeitgeist of the internet right it's like it's what is what is the current conversation of of the internet and and as we were talking about with what know your memes role is is we kind of document how these these conversations change over time like you know there's whole periods of the internet now that seem so different than what's going on today there's like you know like for example the 2011 2012 reddit period that was just non-stop advice animals or like rage <laughs> comics and stuff like that none of that stuff seems funny at all today but back then it was hilarious and everybody loved it <laughs> it's so weird how you know that wasn't very long ago and it's just so different than the meme culture today yeah i guess back a decade ago more a lot of the memes were more humorous whereas now a lot of them seem to be even though they might seem kind of frivolous or um, not very serious on the outside, if you actually look at the content of what they're reflecting, it can be pretty serious and quite political. There's a lot of that. There's a few ways that, that memes have a few ways that memes have gone. So yeah, one way, like you mentioned, is, is political. There's been a big ramp up of political style memes. Um, another way is uh, with in the humor part of it. There's been a lot of memes that go like a few layers deep. Like in order to understand the meme and the joke you have to know all of this other meme stuff in order to to get it and that's just you know building upon all these years of like meme culture that have already occurred but yeah oh yeah memes have been doing some interesting stuff lately and they've also just become more mainstream i mean like internet virality is now mainstream news like i just did an interview with the bbc the other day about grumpy cat's death like the BBC World News is like, you know, interviewing me about Grumpy Cat. Like that's how mainstream <laughs> memes are now, right? Yeah. So, yeah, memes have gone in some interesting directions, that's for sure. At which point does an online community become a subculture? And do you have any tips on detecting emerging subcultures? I mean, the if there's like a, a break point at which something comes a subculture, that's a little bit difficult to, to identify in a clear cut way, I can use like a specific example to kind of illustrate this point. So we track what people are searching for a lot of the time on the site to see kind of gauge interest in certain topics on the internet. And every once in a while, there'll be, you know, certain ones that pop up out of nowhere that we're not familiar with that, you know, just arise seemingly out of nowhere and just consistently, like, you know, several weeks in a row. 
yeah. So like, you know, some of these communities are on Reddit, like there's some, you know, weird, ironic meme communities on Reddit that have risen in popularity recently. And I would consider that to be, you know, a new internet subculture. One of them's like the OK Buddy subreddit. And that's just like all really ironic memes. And I, you'd call them shit posts. Yeah. And yeah, it's like non sequitur humor and, and stuff like that. And like, I remember all of a sudden, I ha- you know, I had no idea that that community existed. And then boom, it was like nonstop for like a week. Mm. You know, there's like, communities on Tumblr that'll pop up out of nowhere for us around some kind of weird topic. Like (laughs) there's numerous like bizarre fetish entries we've had to do on, (laughs) on the site from like deviant art and Tumblr communities that I had no idea existed. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, internet subcultures can be, uh, can be very strange and, and just seem to appear out of nowhere. But yeah, a lot of the time they'll pop up on our radar through through our just search analytics. Like we have, you know, we'll we'll take a look at what people are looking for on our site. And if we're not be, if we're if it's something that we don't have on there, we'll look into it a little bit further and then and then that's a lot of the way that we uh you know discover these new subcultures. Yeah. Do you think any subcultures have been consciously engineered? Or do they just sort of emerge from a community sort of spontaneously? Do you mean do you mean uh, like astroturfing? Like do you, were, were they forced? Yeah, I, I'm just wondering how much of culture uh, has been created by someone that's you know decided at some point I want to create this as a cultural force, and then they somehow achieved it. I wonder if you guys have detected much of that going on, or is it you know pretty hard to do? I mean, I would. <laughs> It's hard. It would be hard to prove something like that definitively, unless there was like some some concrete evidence to to expose that that sort of operation had had occurred. My initial feeling about that would be that it, it would be extremely difficult. Internet communities seem to have a some pretty good safeguards in terms of sniffing out astroturfing and and, and forced and forced memes. People, especially on communities like you know, four chan. Those those sort of places, they they seem to be able to tell when something's being forced too heavily by you know some kind of like you know I don't know corporation or special interest or whatever. It seems like that sort of thing is frowned upon a lot of time. But at the same time, I think that I would it would be naive to suggest that that isn't happening at at some level. And it seems because it was just too powerful of a force for you know these interests to ignore. Yeah, if if anybody, you know, even if they're a corporation or a political force or even an artistic force, if they could harness that and figure out a way to to birth something like that into the culture, they, you know, it could be very powerful, as you say. So I guess, like, perhaps this wouldn't be a subculture invented, but there's been a number of 4chan operations that have been like hoaxes, right? That have been trying to force something into the into the mainstream that appear to have been successful. I mean, like there was the, so the, the okay symbol right now is, is a hot topic with that. And a lot of people on 4chan claim responsibility for it. There was this operation OKKK and there's evidence of these posts where 4chan users were calling for people to conflate the, the white, the uh, okay symbol with the white power symbol. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, this is bit, there's been numerous articles about this. And then there was the Christchurch shooter who actually made the symbol too. Mm. So this is an interesting case in that there's like clear evidence of the hoax operation. Like you can get screenshots of, of the 4chan posts easily. And yeah, it's, it's, it, it's still able to, to circulate really successfully. And, you know, it, uh, there's also, you know, eventually it takes on a life of its own and then you know, actual people like the Christchurch shooter use it. So it, it, it kind of gets out of hand. Yeah, it's, it's quite crazy. I'm actually um, calling in from Christchurch. I'm from Christchurch. So, um, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. It was quite a, quite a crazy time. And um, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, some, pe- some people probably aren't f- that familiar with 4chan. So maybe we could define 4chan and then maybe talk a little bit about this sort of alt-right and the and the kick and the pepe mythology and everything surrounding that because it's pretty yeah it's had some pretty interesting real world crossover now yeah it's a really weird you know really weird uh history uh, of how you know 4chan's gone in those areas 
So yeah, like 4chan, uh, brief description. It's an it's image board. Uh, so people, you know, there's a number of boards. There's like the B board, which is for, you know, random topics. There's a cooking board for, for cooking. There's a TV board for television and film. You know, there's like, you know, boards for people that want to talk about anime, all, the, all that sort of thing. So 4chan has this long history of, of being kind of like a ground zero for memes They've been enormously important in meme culture. In recent years, the politics board has kind of gained infamy because there's been, you know, their their support of uh, a lot of people on their support Donald Trump. And one thing that kind of gets confused about the politics board is that it's not all one thing. I mean, there's all kinds of people that use the politics board. There's you know communists that use the politics board. There's fascists that use the communist the politics board. There's People from all different political persuasions, but people often associate it with the uh, the more right wing elements, and often associate it with the alt right. There have been a lot of pro Trump posts on the politics board leading up to the presidential election, and uh, kind of got the politics board to get you know a reputation, along with uh, posts about you know bigotry and 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 other and other topics on it. And then there's another another image board called 8chan, which is also, you know, had similar uh, associations with the Christchurch shooting recently. There was a you know a, a post on there supposedly by the shooter prior to the the incident taking place. I can't remember which board on the 8chan image board it was, but I mean the, the, it's been a really weird history for it. So a lot of people will associate 4chan with poll these days, especially people that aren't familiar with the website's history and, and its other boards and, and its um, very diverse community of users that uh, a lot of people aren't aware that it has a very diverse community. There's also the the business or biz board, which was a oh, quite, yeah. quite a massive ground zero and still is for, for cryptocurrency. And oh, a, lot, a lot of the, a lot yeah. of the memes and uh, things like Wojaks and weird things that came out of the out of the whole crypto hype. Um, yeah, the pink wojacks. Yeah, yeah. The pink wojacks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, those pink wo- that's a yeah, pink wojacks a good meme. Yeah, yeah, those uh oh my god, I invested all of my money in cryptocurrency and it's uh and it's tanking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the the images of some it's like an inside out person with bleeding eyes. Um yeah. Yeah, they <laughs> get pretty kind of- intense with those pink wojacks, <laughs> huh? Yeah. They, they yeah. really go for it. Yeah, yeah, they really do. Yeah, this the, the on the poll side, and this this sort of also bleeds over into biz a little bit. Is the is the Pepe and you know the the famous frog that was been wasn't it hijacked from an artist and then not sort of gotten out of his control and has become a symbol for the for the alt right. I mean, it's such a weird history with that that yeah. meme. I mean, Pepe meme is yeah like a decade old. It was a meme used by all kinds of different people from all kinds of different communities. And it's still, it still honestly is a lot of people just aren't aware. Like, yeah, Pepe memes to this day are still used by people in completely non bigoted contexts. But yeah, for the longest time, Pepe was just, was this character. It was uh, invented by this artist, Matt Fury, and it kind of gained fame online with a specific comic in which Pepe is peeing in a toilet with his pants around his ankles <laughs> and his friend walks in on him and discovers him doing that. And he's like, you know, what are you doing? And then Pepe's like, feels good, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he, yeah, it feels good. Man was the, was the first version of Pepe. It got big. And then, you know, people turned it into feels bad man and, and sad frog version of it, which would, so it's a reaction image. You'd, you know, you'd post, Pepe is feels good man in response to something that f- makes you feel good and feels bad man when something makes you feel bad. Pretty yeah, simple. Yeah. Then Pepe's would become all these different variations. There's, you know, there's a Pepe for every reaction you can think of. And then there was rare Pepe's, which were like, like a internet trading card game kind of, but as a joke, right? Like it was just the idea that you could have these like, you know, rare versions of, of Pepe. It was like acid trip ones where Pepe's got like a psychedelic background, you know, like this is a rare acid Pepe or whatever. 
So yeah, Pepe has this crazy long history. And then, you know, when the 2016 election happened, there were some Pepe's that were in support of Trump on, on 4chan. There was a, a Daily Beast article that was written that was interviewing these two guys saying they were trying to take Pepe back from the normies. Because Pepe had been posted by people like Nicki Minaj and uh, Katy Perry. Uh, yeah. And and so they they claimed they were trying to uh, take Pepe back by from the normies, which are just like normal everyday people, and they would do it by making bigoted versions of him that were distasteful and offensive. So there, that Daily Beast article happened, and then during the election, Donald Trump's son, uh, Donald Trump Jr., posted on Instagram a photoshopped version of the Expendables poster, which was a a film with a bunch of action stars. And the faces of the people in the poster were replaced with like Trump people or conservative right wing figures on the internet, like Milo Yiannopoulos and Mm -hmm. whatever. And one of them was a, was a Trump Pepe. After that, People, uh, I think it was like a Heidi Bryrick of the Southern Poverty Law Center did a couple of interviews with some news organizations. And she said that it was a white nationalist symbol or a symbol associated with white na- nationalism that it, when referring to Pepe. And then that got spread around a bit. And then the Hillary Clinton campaign posted an explainer about Pepe and saying it was uh, associated with white nationalism. So, yeah, there was, uh, there was a period where, you know, n- this kind of one instance on Instagram kind of people jumped on it to associate Donald Trump Jr. with white nationalism. And then Richard Spencer, the infamous salt right white supremacist guy, he wore a Pepe pen after Trump's inauguration. And then he was famously punched in the face on video. And, and that also was a big thing. So yeah, it was a weird thing. And that, you know, there weren't really, I almost never, I can't really remember ever seeing a bigoted Pepe prior to the news media coverage claiming it was a white supremacist symbol. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, I was exposed to it so often, like for years. I mean, we had an article on Pepe for, articles on Pepe the Frog memes, you know, for like I said, for a decade. And then after all this news media coverage happened, it was just, yeah, this is a, <laughs> this is a white supremacist symbol now. And then the actual white supremacists adopted it. Yeah. <laughs> very, very weird how that all went down. Yeah, it's a strange whole big mythology that sort of surrounds, that they've sort of somehow created and managed to maintain. And it seems like, yeah, as you're saying, maybe the mainstream news had a part to play in that. Um, push certainly, yeah, yeah, certainly did. It seems like for sure. Yeah, yeah. What are the mechanics of virality and are there any common elements within viral memes or videos or viral content in general? Yeah, I mean, this is like kind of like the million dollar question that every marketer wants an answer for, right? (laughs) (laughs) Every like advertising team is like trying to get this nailed down. Um, Yeah, I mean, it's a it's it's a hard one to get to to just, you know, kind of get down into bullet points, but. There seem to be a few things that that are kind of generally common about about what goes viral. I mean, there's been a number of studies. There's a Wharton School, uh, Jonah Berger, I think his name is, is a professor who's done a number of investigations into this. And uh, one of the things that at least he found is that high valence content seems to be more commonly viral. So content that causes a strong emotional reaction yeah will tend to have an increased chance of being of being viral i mean we see this time and time and again where you know yeah most people will associate meme with funny they'll they'll they think the word meme means something that's funny right i don't think that i think memes are are more complex than that but that is common that something that a lot of people think is really funny will spread but i think that um We've seen, especially recently with all the political memes and stuff, that things that make people really, really mad spread really well. Outrage content, I think, might even be more viral than funny content sometimes. Stuff that makes people really sad doesn't quite have the same virality, it seems. But yeah, 
things that piss people off really spread far and wide. I think though that one of the key factors to all this stuff too is is the is the factor of signaling and what people want to say about themselves that helps things go viral. If something if somebody is able to say something they want to say about themselves with a meme or a piece of viral content, I think that really helps it go. Like something that that people want to be associated with is is a big deal. And I think that that is often overlooked is is the signaling aspect of the internet. I got my degree in um in anthropology and I I, I focused on like evolutionary anthropology and evolutionary theory when it comes to when it comes to that side of anthro and and yeah, signaling theory is something that I I had a I had a lot of fun with and I think is uh is super fun. It's a super good lens to look at social media through because I've noticed that posts yeah as you say posts should usually contain probably more signaling than natural information for people to to jump on board and to support or or talk about and you can get into really hot water if you don't signal enough when you're talking about edgy topics political topics right yeah Robin Hansen, he wrote a book called, um, co-wrote a book called Elephant in the Brain, and he talks about signaling a lot. And he gets in hot water on Twitter constantly because he does, never signals anything, and he asks really awkward and sometimes quite offensive questions and polls. And people just because there's no signaling, he's not indicating his position. Yeah, you know, people yeah. just people just go crazy at him. And you know, I've noticed that looking through Facebook on my feed and you can see that the majority of it does seem to be signaling. And once you can look at it through that lens, you can actually understand it a lot better, what people are up to online. It really makes me, uh, it really makes me feel for people that are more on the spectrum because it, that must be infinitely more difficult for mm-hmm. them to mm-hmm. navigate these internet waters of signaling. And they probably, are, yeah, <laughs> it must be very, very, very difficult times for them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was it always like this on the internet or has the signaling thing become more amplified recently? Definitely become more amp- amplified, hands down. I mean, like, you know, and this, I think this is largely due to just the adoption and how ubiquitous and widespread internet usage is. Like, you, you, you have to be on the internet all the time now. So, and, and everyone has to be. I think that's, it's largely due to that. It's a way to, to get ahead, right? It's a way to, to improve your career all that sort of thing. So yeah, I mean, it's going to, it's going to be more widespread because people are using it to compete. Yeah. And I suppose in real life, there's so many other sort of subconscious signaling going on that you don't need to explicitly state a lot of your positions before you talk about things. Whereas on online, it's a different type of identity and it's just text. And when you read just text, it can come across as very brash. People tend to, seem to prefer signaling in combination with actual discussion or information. Yeah, I think uh, that's kind of been this trend towards uh, doing tribalism and tribal warfare on the internet as a new kind of battlefield, I think, is, is a lot going on there with that. Like, yeah, it seems like it was, uh, it was just ripe for that sort of, ad- that, that sort of warfare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the culture wars. I might just come back. There was one thing I didn't explore on that whole um, alt right paper yeah, mythology sure. thing. Um, was the was the shooting actually, and it's the causality that I, I'm interested in your view on because when the shooting happened here, it was horrific and surreal and crazy. Absolutely, and, uh, yeah. But the thing that I didn't quite agree with was that a lot of people claimed that 4chan or 8chan and the memes caused this shooting it's a direct result of that culture and i in my view i I disagree i think that culture is culture and it's always there and there are always going to be chaotic actors that will do crazy shit and they will do crazy shit on any justification and that particular shooter was a psychopath so that's that's my view but i'm wondering if you have yeah if you've got any different views or any other um I mean, any of those, any of those people who who argue that the memes caused it, like those same people would think it would be ridiculous. So let's say the shooter referenced Game of Thrones during the shooting, right? Let's say he like you know referenced Daenerys or or some, <laughs> yeah. or some shit like that. Yeah. 
those people who argue that memes cause a shooting would def would not argue that Game of Thrones caused the shooting. I would be very I would be very surprised if anyone did. Yeah. If he had a, if he had referenced Game of Thrones, so I think it's more that that he referenced a culture that they're not familiar with, is why they blamed it. Right. Mm-hmm. That said, I think that you know some of these these sites and these you know communities can be extremely toxic and can make people you know more toxic perhaps i don't know but in terms of blaming m- the memes he's referencing you know that like he said subscribe to pewdiepie or whatever th- to blame pewdiepie for that shooting would be absolutely absurd yeah in my view yeah yeah there was some big reactionary things that happened here for example one of the things that happened was you know the shooting happened and actually nearly the whole country came together and unified against the shooting and in solidarity with the people that were killed and it was actually quite a big unification moment which was quite rare uh, globally i think here but um yeah i mean that was great for a few days and then then some media articles came out saying that the local rugby team should change their name because their name was the Crusaders. And mm-hmm. uh, I immediately saw through that with the, the whole media climate where attention is the economy. And as you've mentioned before, outrage and uh, anger gets seems to get the most virality or views. And there's sort of a lot of the media are floundering and advertising revenue trying to stay afloat. So I just saw through it as probably a way that the media with the perverse incentives are trying to stay alive and they've made this argument and it it surely had that effect it like cut the population in half because so many people like rugby i don't give i don't give a shit about rugby personally but (laughs) (laughs) um but i i was not on the side of changing the name of a of a rugby team that's been around for i think like 15 years um there was a uh, rugby player who is islamic he played for them for several years and yeah, the argument was because the Crusaders killed Muslims and religious wars hundreds or even thousands of years ago, that they should change the name. And I don't think they're going to change the name now, but it just created this big shitstorm. And hmm. it's just, there's so many of these, I think they've been called scissor statements. It's like, there's a whole unified community and you can just make a random statement, even if the statement was never a problem before. And then you can suddenly divide the community into two and make them... Uh, at odds with one another. And that just seems to be happening en masse online at the moment. I'm not familiar with that term. That, that you said scissor? Scissor statement. Sta- scissor statement. And so it's a, it's a dividing statement, something that's a, like a wedge between yeah. two yeah, warring, warring uh, teams. Yeah. Um, well, it, it yeah, was like, like, interesting. So, like, a, like a community that was once united generally, but then you just create a, a scissor right between the two on some issue that is a black and white issue that probably has a lot more nuance but that everyone will feel strongly about, so it will, it will naturally divide them. And your your kind of initial read is that that was something being perpetuated by a starving media that needs that viral story, right? That's my view of how it probably emerged, yeah. Yeah. I would say, as someone who's been dealing with viral media for nearly a decade now, I would say that, yes, this is something that definitely happens a lot, uh, especially on the internet. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's controversies, quote unquote controversies that se- that occur that, you know, when I look into them a little bit closer, it's like, where where's the controversy? <laughs> like, where, where was, the- there's been things like, um, I- I've seen hashtags that arose. There was, I think the, yeah, one I looked into a number of years ago that was the most striking about it, and it was one that actually had some data to expose it, was it was uh, it was Boycott Star Wars, I believe is what it was. <laughs> okay. And there were it was after the the first, you know, Disney reboot trailer came out. And apparently there were these tweets that were calling for a boycott to Star Wars for for racist reasons or something. And then the the hashtag took off. And so we, I, I looked into it, and then I found that there was this uh, Twitter analytics company that did a look into the hashtag to see what the sentiment analysis of it was. Discovered that something like ninety high nineties percent of all the tweets with the hashtag were expressing their outrage about it. <laughs> so there was like, 
almost no tweets actually calling for this boycott, but all these people just call it this, you know, <laughs> using the hashtag to say to, to say that they were mad about the, the, the hashtag. <laughs> it was pretty amazing. It seems like uh, that's kind of like an extreme example, but I think that this sort of thing ha- plays out a lot like that online and that, you know, something that's relatively small or even almost non-existent will become a big thing just for the the outrage story. Yeah, and one last thing about the rugby thing is that, it, again, like the shooter with uh, 8chan or 4chan, it somehow implies causality if they change their name. It's like, oh, yeah, because they were called the Crusaders, somehow an Australian white nationalist came over here and killed people. It's like, just doesn't make any sense causally at all. But if they did change it, to me, it's it's like almost admitting causality and uh, implication within that horrible act. And that's what made me so... It, it could cause a little bit of outrage at me at the fact that it was dividing people. <laughs> so they had, I, I they see what you're had, saying. So yeah. you're saying that, yeah, if, if they uh, did change the name, they would be saying that, you know, we were partially responsible for this tragedy or whatever, which is doesn't, you know, there's no connection whatsoever. No, and they've done the opposite. They've actually caused a lot of cultural unification with the native Maori people here playing in the team and, and the European New Zealanders playing together. And rugby's done a lot of, a lot of that. Um, so it's, yeah, I don't know. That's just my view anyway. I'm sure some people would disagree with me and that's that's fine. But uh, anyway, we can move on. So you mentioned that you studied anthropology and um, you've talked a bit about some insights you've had. Are there any other insights you've had into human behavior that you've gleaned from your years that know your meme? Anything surprising or um, particularly insightful? I guess uh, it's been surprising to watch how quickly culture can evolve now. You know, that was one of the things that I was really into in school was just cultural evolution in general. And I guess that's, I suppose that's why I ended up at Know Your Meme. So there's, you know, biological evolution, there's cultural evolution, and uh, just the speed at which cultural evolution can occur is is sometimes so so mind-boggling and surprising how quickly cultural attitudes can change about about a given topic or how quickly humor, like, like I mentioned before, how quickly humor can change. But yeah, it's, it's been probably the most striking thing about, about witnessing the way things change on Know Your Meme is how, how quickly cultural attitudes can change about things. Yeah. Is there anything exciting coming up that you guys are working on at Know Your Meme? Yeah. I mean, on the horizon, we got the, you know, democratic primary coming up, which is, gonna be ridiculous uh for the (laughs) united states election you know there's just a completely crowded primary with all these candidates and it's gonna be interesting to see how this plays out and then after that of course we'll have the general election with with trump and that will be a whole nother circus so yeah yeah, I, i guarantee you this is that's gonna take over the meme cycle for a bit and uh yeah (laughs) <laughs> that's what I have to look forward to. <laughs> yeah, 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 no doubt. So we know the power of virality, right? And how it's affected the world. Is there anything that you've seen that was particularly surprising in virality and its effect globally? Well, when you say affected the world, it's going to change my answer. Because the first thing that popped in my head wasn't something that really ne- necessarily affected the world. Well, let's start well, with the that first one. Thing that, go, for, go for that one first. First thing <laughs> that popped into my head when you said something that like surprised me about the power of reality was this story. You might be familiar with it. It happened a number of years ago. Is this woman, uh, Justine Sacco. I don't know if you're familiar with her story, but she was like some, you know, no name, like marketing person, you know, not, not well known at all. Had like maybe a couple hundred followers on Twitter. And then she, uh, was on her way to Africa and she tweeted a very unfortunate joke. It was pretty, pretty offensive about I think I can't remember the exact joke, but it was something about how uh, she was on her way to Africa and she hopes she doesn't get AIDS. Oh uh, yeah, I she, remember that. It, but yeah, yeah, yeah. And then she's like, "Just kidding, I'm white." Really, really bad taste joke. Incredibly offensive. Very bad taste. She was drunk as well, or something, right? I think that was the excuse. Some, oh, right, right. Yeah. yeah, there might have been some alcohol involved. But uh, you know, a journalist uh, discovered this tweet. Which, you know, as I said before, she had like maybe a couple, few hundred followers, the most, something like that. Very, this woman probably did not expect this tweet to get very far. 
you know, the, all these articles were made about this tweet and the whole hashtag arose, you know, has Justine landed yet? Because they were, people were reveling in the fact that once she landed, you know, her life would be upside down. And, um, yeah, she, she got fired. She landed, she got fired from her job and, and, you know, the, she had a pretty rough time for a little bit. And then there was this, um, this book by his name, uh, John Ronson. It's called, uh, so you have been publicly shamed and he kind of does like a whole follow up of this. And yeah, like at the time, like, you know, when something like that went down, I remember when, the, when it went down and we, we covered it on know your meme, you know, everybody's just like reveling and just, you know, destroying this woman. Right. And yeah, like, like the joke is was pretty pretty bad. It's mm-hmm. like it's a bad joke to make on Twitter, especially you know, t- like you know, not, not wise, not very, not wise. Yeah. At the same time, it was just, it was just like yeah, really exposing. Like wow, it's the internet's really, <laughs> really powerful. I mean, like she was fired quick, mm. and it wasn't just you know if she had been a person with a big following, you know, it, but yeah, she was she didn't have you know much of a following at all so it was really just weird that it got discovered mm. um so that was kind of like the, one of the first times i was like wow okay somebody with even a really small following can fuck up and have it you know completely turn turn their world upside down so yeah that that's kind of the first one that comes to mind when you ask that question in terms of uh changing the world whew, that's <laughs> that one's a bit more of a doozy <laughs> You know, I guess like a lot of people would maybe reference Trump. Yeah. Because like after Trump won the election, a common kind of slogan was from from people on poll was that, you know, they memed him into office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you heard that one before. Like, yeah, the Trump was memed, memed into the presidency. I don't know if that's true. I think it might be true a little bit. I don't know. It's hard to, it's hard to quantify that, right? It's hard to prove that. Uh, yeah. It's It's the kind of thing that, you know... I think it's more, it's, it's funny to, to think about somebody being memed into a presidency. It's, it's kind of like absurd, right? It's yeah. a, a weird, a weird thing to think about, but yeah, I don't, I don't know how much that, I don't know how much memes had to actually do with Trump winning the presidency. And I, I don't, I mean, they might've, but it's hard to tell. I think virality definitely did help Trump get a following. And I think that was, I would even put more of the blame on that to legacy media, you know, like the, the nonstop cable news coverage of Trump would, I would even say was a little bit more important Mm. than the internet memes. But yeah, that one also comes to mind. Yeah. He, he, so, so mobs are back and Trump successfully jacked the, uh, the legacy media system. So they just, they just couldn't stop paying attention to him. Pretty interesting, (laughs) pretty interesting cycle there. So I thought we might better explore a few strange internet subcultures. Uh, maybe you can give some insight as to what they are and their current status within culture, if they're rising or if they're falling, if they're sort of just coasting along. Uh, sure. And these are all from Know Your Meme. So the first one I've got here is Deep Fakes. Oh, yeah. Deep deep Fakes are... Uh, it's a, well, it's a super interesting... It's a, I would call it more of a technology than a subculture, but... Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's pretty impressive technology. It's the uh, the ability to kind of take a video, make a video, and superimpose another person's face onto the video to make it appear as if you know they're the one speaking. Pretty disturbing to think about the the possibilities for such technology. But also uh, pretty good for memes. There's some Nicolas Cage ones out there <laughs> that are primo. <laughs> there's a there's a YouTube channel called Derp Fakes. So yeah, I guess this could be called a subculture. The 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 people that go along with this. Yeah, Derp Fakes is one of, is I guess the channel that I'm most familiar with when it comes to deep fakes. And they've done a number of of Nicolas Cage deep fakes, putting his his face onto other other actors and actresses and it's kind of riffing on this like really old meme called nick cage's everyone which originally started as a as a blog where they would just put photoshop nick nick cage's face onto onto everyone (laughs) um you know just like the name and yeah i mean i gotta admit i'm 
like Nick Cage and Nick Cage related memes are some of my favorite. I don't know why. <laughs> like there's a whole subreddit called One True God, which is just treats Nicolas Cage as if he's some kind of deity. <laughs> and I I love I love that subreddit. Like <laughs> Know Your Memes old developer uh James he was a bit. He's a big Nick Cage fan. He, uh, I, I give him credit for getting me into Nick Cage. He's seen <laughs> some absurd number of Nick Cage movies, um, like something like sixty at this point. And yeah, whenever I say that, people are like, "What? Nick Cage has done sixty movies?" And I'm like, "Yeah, it's like, probably more." <laughs> if you were locked in a dystopian future torture chamber with one Nicolas Cage movie on repeat for the rest of your life, what would it be? I like Mandy a lot. I think Man- and Mandy just came like probably his newest one it's so good what a good movie <laughs> okay um i guess like of his older ones like vampire's kiss is so good like a lot of people aren't from very familiar with that one but a lot of the like you know nick cage is fucking crazy clips on the internet come from this movie like there's like a bunch of super cuts of nick cage acting like a lunatic and uh, a lot of them use clips from from Vampire's Kiss, and he plays this. I can't. He like works at an accounting office or something. Is it like an accounting executive or I can't remember exactly what his job is, but he's this lunatic that thinks he's becoming a vampire after he has like a one night stand with some some woman, <laughs> and then he just like starts descending into madness, and you know, think yeah, he thinks he's a vampire. It's absolutely hilarious. Fantastic film. Highly recommend it. Gonna check that one out. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> um, just back to the deep fakes briefly. They, there's an interesting thing I've seen online with deep fakes and also the faked audio thing. And a lot of people seem to seem to get fooled by them quite easily. I can still see through all the ones that I've seen. Um, yeah. You can still tell if you look at the way the, the mouth moves. And if you listen to the audio and the way that it's cut, there's still slight parts that they haven't quite nailed down to make it yeah, sound Yeah, something's natural. off still. Yeah, yeah. 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 Do you think it, they'll get to the point where it will be indistinguishable? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd wager, yeah, that they that they will. I mean, I agree that right currently there's something off still in the deep fakes. You can tell if, you, if you're looking closely. And yeah, with the audio, there was like one that came out the other day of Joe Rogan. I don't know if you, you saw that one. It was uh, basically like a you know some kind of AI program did a you know Joe Rogan interview basically that sounded a lot like Joe Rogan but wasn't quite him. Yeah, right. Like you could tell there was there was a no, like there were a number of tells like it was had a, a quite a few robotic um, sounds it was making. Yeah, right. Um, but yeah, I, I would I would wager that you know the technology will get there. I mean, it's, it's pretty impressive how far they've gone, you know, so far so quickly. Uh, I think it would only make sense if it, you know, got to the point that it was extremely difficult to tell without software. I'm sure, you know, I, I think that, you know, as this technology progresses, there's going to be software that progresses as well, that will be able to, you know, spot what, what our ears and our eyes cannot spot in terms of tells that it's been doctored or, or manipulated. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to see Joe Rogan reacting to that new one you've just talked about. And also, uh, there's a great clip where someone's got him interviewing himself and they've just like shopped him oh, on yeah. the side. That's brilliant. <laughs> it's really I love the, I love those. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen a couple of those uh, where he's interviewing himself. Or, yeah, there's some, those are pretty hilarious. Yeah, yeah. All right, next, uh, next subculture is Vaporwave. I actually like vaporwave i think it's like there's something just super soothing about that kind of music um yeah that kind of i mean it had this kind of like internet hipster thing going on with it as well that was a little bit more annoying but and then there were things like simpson wave which like <laughs> yeah. took vaporwave with like simpsons footage and stuff like that could we yeah define, I mean, could we define vaporwave for, for those that maybe don't know what it is yeah, so let's see. Vaporwave, I'd explain it as like it's like it's an electronic type of music, but it's really chill kind of uh there was a a genre of of music that's associated with like chill wave, 
yeah. all these all, they all use wave in the name and it's basically like very chill smooth it kind of a, a very 80s sounding yeah electronic music and vaporwave yeah. vaporwave used a lot of sort of windows 98 samples and you know 90s right. 90s sort of visual components that they've sort of rehashed yeah. and reanimated and things like this yeah, there'll be a lot of that. Like, yeah, the, the Windows aesthetic, the kind of early, like the 1990s th- uh, 3D rendering. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, there's a lot of a lot of that going on. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's a it's an interesting genre. And then you know, there's there's also the genre of like synthwave in general, which is very very 1980s and very into that whole aesthetic and very cyberpunk. And I on Reddit they'll refer to it as an outrun that's closely related. Yeah. All, all of these wave genres have been really big on the internet and it's been really interesting to watch. I, for the most part, actually am a fan because I, I, this is the kind of music I like, but uh, yeah, I think that they're very silly and they're very like self-aware yeah. and the, and how over the top the aesthetic is. And yeah, I think it's been really interesting to watch how far it's gone. And so, yeah, it was, it's even weird. It got into you know, then there was some some weird political elements of it. There was like, uh, what was it like, fast wave? Where like alt right were getting into it or something? And uh, there was yeah. like, like that was really weird. I didn't really get exposed to too much of that. I just we did an article on it. I know your meme, but uh, I don't think it, I can't remember if I wrote that one or not. <laughs> I forget. <laughs> I forget. I forget what I write. But yeah, that was weird. Yeah, there's been so there was C punk, yeah. which is kind of another related genre with like the the visual art of it was very 90s as well and kind of um lisa frank stuff kind of ish like i don't know if lisa frank is this you know in the in the 90s or whatever there was this brand that would have these like school organizers like folders that would have this extremely loud artwork on the covers <laughs> yeah. that this is kind of that uh c-punk always kind of remind me re- reminded me of like for children yeah um, so. yeah we had some wrapping that you could get for your books and i remember seem to remember this similar to that sort of dolphins and sort of undersea yeah. and sort of, sort of glittery and super bright colors and yeah, yeah. Very, kind, of, kind of like yeah psychedelic like yeah. in a way like super kind of trippy trippy shit yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I quite dig those those genres as well. Some friends and I make a bit of music that's definitely takes elements from chill wave and, and vapor wave and synth wave. So it's nice. It's, it's good fun. All right, next up is Otherkin. Oh oh boy. <laughs> Otherkin. Yeah. This is one that's uh you know, it's always one of those ones that's like I've always been like, how serious <laughs> is this? You know? <laughs> Like it always sounded like to me like um, something that was you know the people that were saying their other kin are probably memeing. So other kin are people that say that they identify as like um, you know mythological creatures or you know like a dragon or or you know elf or I don't know some kind of stuff like that. Well, there's been memes about other kin too. There was like a. I think, yeah, I can't really remember the details. Oh, there was one that was like someone saying like, fuck you, I'm a dragon. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Something yeah. like that. Yeah. And then, you know, fuck you, I'm a dragon became a meme. And there's the, yeah. there's the, I'm a wolf and always except physical as well. Right? Oh, yes. We interviewed him. I, I, I've talked to him a couple of times, the kid who was in that. Yeah, that, okay. First of all, that. That episode is hilarious and <laughs> it's, it's very fun. The clip, the clip of that like scene is really great because he he goes like you know in, in all aspects except physical. I'm a wolf, and then it cuts to a scene of him like looking out into the water and barking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just yeah, it's, it's it's wonderful. Whoever was editing that did a did a fantastic job. Um, yeah, and like that too, like even hit that, like, and we interviewed him too. Like, I think a lot of that is just, you know, there, he's having fun, you know, he's having fun on the internet. I don't know how much, like, they're really taking that seriously and, and, and how much is just like having fun on the online and, and playing, you know? 
Yeah, it's it's interesting that maybe some of these cultures start up as sort of yeah fun and taking the piss, but then other people might discover it <laughs> and then take it right, seriously. Right. Um, well, then but, there's furries. Yeah, I was about to say. I was about to say. Yeah, there's the furry culture, which is pretty pretty closely related, right? Like, they. Um, what, I mean, what what are furries for those that don't know? So yeah, furries are these like people that uh, they have what they refer to as a fursona a lot of the time. That's their kind of like anthropomorphic animal version of themselves, and a lot of it's really tied to like artwork. Like they'll they'll draw versions of themselves as a as an anthropomorphic animal what i mean by that is that if they don't just draw like a normal looking cat and say that that's their that's themselves they draw like a cat that's walks on that's a bipedal cat Mm. that looks like a cat human with a flirtatious expression right right yeah a lot of it (laughs) seems like there's some kink go like a lot of the furry community is associated with the kind of like sexual aspect of it and there's been a lot of memes with furries and it's been, that's been, yeah. If I was to answer your question about one of the more surprising things we're going to know your meme is, is how many times the furry community has popped up in meme culture. Yeah. I mean, if you just like search the word furry on know your meme, there's just like so many entries that pop up and yeah, they're kind of, it's, it's an interesting community in that like, you know, there's been a, a number of Know Your Meme users that are furries, and but some of the more most helpful people on the site have been furries in terms of like contributing and editing entries and, and all that sort of thing. We've, I wouldn't have been exposed to those people if I hadn't worked at Know Your Meme. Yeah. But yeah, it's a really, really interesting subculture. I got to admit that there's been a number of times that I've accidentally stumbled upon furry porn and wished <laughs> I hadn't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wished I hadn't made that click. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's something that exists. More recently, there's a uh, a gamer Sonic Fox who uh, who was crowned a esports player of the year at the Game Awards, and he's a furry and very very public about it. So yeah, furry community has been a lot more interesting than I would have suspected <laughs> when yeah. I first started at the site. Yeah. This this podcast is like as kind of a transhumanist perspective, so it's looking towards the future and what humans are turning ourselves into and what we'll evolve into. Um, yeah, through various mechanisms, which is really always really interesting. And yeah, furries are, are essentially transhumanists in that regard, and so I uh, I support them. I uh, you know, it's not really anything for me, but it seems like a quite a benign, you know, strange but, but benign yeah. sort of culture. And and I'm I'm really happy for the weirder cultures as long as they're benign. Man, go for it. Have a good time. Do your thing. You for know? sure. They're not, as long as they're not hurting anybody else, who cares? You know. Yeah. I'm like, or, or hurt them, you know, not even hurting themselves. Like it's just yeah. like they're, you know, but like I, I think it's really interesting to see how these, you know, communities go onto virtual spaces and are able to kind of. Like, so I think like, you know, Second Life and then now there's VR chat, which are these, you know, online virtual spaces where people get to have these avatars that are custom. Yeah. And it's really interesting to see how, how these get used. And yeah, they're, they're kind of kind of ripe for communities like furries or people that are that want to, you know, be transhumanist in a way. VR chat, I think, is super interesting right now for having like, you know, your own custom body or. Or, or avatar it's a, a place that people are getting pretty creative with that is there anywhere any examples of that we could check out vr chat just a brief explanation it's a uh it's a multiplayer virtual reality game hence the name vr so people can log into it and then can use a vr headset i think it's optional to interact in a kind of open environment with other people online and you're able to adopt an avatar of your choice. There's been a number of viral videos of uh, coming out of this site. One of the, you know, some of the big ones have been like people being anime girls in there, and those are actually quite common. There seems to be a lot of a lot of people running around with anime avatars. There's you know a couple of viral videos. There's one of a, a kid in a Kermit the Frog avatar who you know has kind of a heart to heart with the stranger about being bullied at school that people thought was pretty heartwarming. Yeah. And then there, you know, one of the most infamous, I suppose, uh, things to come out of Yocha was the Ugandan knuckles meme 
there was this avatar of kind of like a bizarre looking version of the character Knuckles, the video game character from Sonic the Hedgehog. They would go around, you know, saying things like, do you know the way? But like in like a mock, I guess like a, yeah, like a mock African accent. They were kind of referencing this, um, these videos. It was one movie like, who killed Captain Alex? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Hollywood is what it's called, I think. Really funny, funny film. Very low budget action film. Yeah, that, that kind of exploded across the internet with people just like, and it's weird because VR chat is, seems like it's a relatively small community, but the videos of these avatars exploded of people going around as this, you know, weird looking Knuckles character and tons of people would just swarm on the game as wearing this avatar. And then the meme got big outside of it. There was people just making like images referencing the Uganda Knuckles character, and then you know there was uh, some accusations that it was promoting bigotry because it was uh, mimicking an African accent, and then uh, eventually you know died because it was just all over the place for way too long. That was actually one of our biggest, most trafficked entries on the site was was that entry. Wow. Um, yeah, really weird. Um, <laughs> That's super weird and quite meta. Yeah, La- layers and layers of memes on top of each other. Ah, uh, yeah, pretty pretty strange. It's, it's definitely it's in like the top fifteen on the or top twenty on the site in terms of you know most views of all time. You can actually search if you go onto the database. You can sort by views in the meme database section of the site and and see it on there. But um, that was a that was a weird one. Yeah, Fortnite. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really know much about it, uh, and then I did a little bit of research before this chat, and it seems to be just ridiculously massive, and it's huge. It Absolutely even, huge. Even seems to be having real world crossovers in weird ways. So, yeah, could you talk a little bit about Fortnite, what it is, and the phenomena? Yeah. Phenomenon? So, yeah, Fortnite is a multiplayer game it's part of this like uh genre known as like a a battle royale game and that's like where you you kind of jump into like a location everybody jumps in at the same kind of like limited area and then most of the time it kind of slowly gets smaller like there'll be some kind of like barrier that keeps closing in on all the players so they get you know as the course of the the game goes on they have to get squeezed into a smaller smaller space among each other so that you know they have to fight each other eventually they can't just hide the whole time yeah it's enormously popular like absolutely absurdly popular especially with with you know kids there's been a number of of memes associated with it there's cele- there's people that are celebrities now because of this game pretty much there's a you know the, the most famous twitch streamer is this guy ninja who ex- pretty much exclusively plays Fortnite. You know, he's played Fortnite with like rappers like Drake. It's 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 absolutely huge. Some of the big things in it that are kind of culturally significant are that there's these dances in the game that have kind of taken a life of of their own. Some of them came came around before the game, but the game made them even more popular. Well, I you know, suppose the most famous one is the floss where you know people like uh, you kind of swish your hips side to side while you throw your arms in between your hips too it's kind of hard to explain um but that one's the most famous dance there's been some like even more recently with the the avengers like the new avengers movie had references to fortnite in it which is crazy because it's you know that's like the biggest movie to come out in a while and uh yeah there's also, a number of just general memes that were tied to it. There was uh, last th- year there was this Ligma meme that was kind of annoyingly ubiquitous for a moment in time, and it was associated with Ninja, that's that streamer. Um, and it was just this like fictional. It was like a a gag name. You know, people would say that Ninja died of Ligma, even though Ninja hadn't, you know, Ninja was perfectly fine. And people would be like, what's Ni- Ligma? And people would be like, you know, Ligma balls, <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> and they'd be like, you know, and then the other gag names came around because of it, like Sugma. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so for similar reasons. 
been, it's been pretty crazy how big Fortnite got. I think one of the reasons it got, it's been able to get so big is that, yeah, it has all these cultural things tied to it, like the dances and everything that people can meme. It's also free to play. So there's a low barrier to entry. You can just, you know, get the game for free. It was able to to really gain popularity on Twitch, which is such a huge platform. I mean, it's so surprising to people that aren't connected to it. Like people that don't know Twitch have no idea how big of a force it is. So Twitch is but, this Twitch is this streaming platform for mostly for video games, right? Right. So Twitch, yeah, Twitch is a streaming platform. It, it initially, was limited to video game streaming, but now there people will do other sorts of streams on it. Where they'll just like either just talk to their viewers, or there's even real life streams where they'll they'll stream themselves out in real life, like going to an event or doing pranks out in public or, or whatever. But yeah, it's mostly associated with video game streaming. And that can be very surprising to, to some people that, you know, tons of people will tune in to watch somebody else play a, a video game. <laughs> well, it's, it's bigger than the biggest sporting events in America now, right? Some, uh, some, some of the events on Twitch. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think there's been some absurd viewer numbers. I, can't, I, don't, I don't know any, any specific numbers offhand, but I, yeah, there's been some absolute astronomical viewer numbers for Twitch, for yeah. sure. Yeah, I've got one more subculture sort of a subculture and that's xavier renegade angel oh man (laughs) i love xavier renegade angel (laughs) i'm so happy that 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 kind of saw a brief or yeah i don't know it kind of like popped up on 4chan i think again in 2017 is when i think i did the entry yeah so xavier renegade angel it was this adult swim 3d animated show that was just absolutely ridiculous and it was uh about this you know kind of shaman character that was a kind of an amalgamation between like a bird and a he had a snake hand and these weird backwards calves (laughs) and uh it was like really yeah it was like a very psychedelic show like he would go on these weird like spiritual journeys and absolutely crazy the stuff that they would do in the show one of my favorite episodes is they go to burning man but they call it burning person (laughs) (laughs) and then they kind of just like parody the whole burner subculture and having been somebody that was you know i've been to burning man a couple of times yeah i think it did a good job of (laughs) of making fun of the burner community Yeah, yeah um it kind of like saw like a brief resurgence in 2017 on 4chan. I remember, especially with people kind of uh, comparing it to Rick and Morty and being like, you know, Rick and Morty sucks compared to this show. Yeah, it was yeah. way better. And, <laughs> seen that one. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 you know, I haven't been somebody like I, yeah, I kind of, I think Xavier Renegade Angel is uh, probably one of my favorite shows of all time. So yeah. Yeah. I'm a big fan of it. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Um, one of my favorite things is that it looks like it's used the same graphics engine out of The Sims. Yeah, you know something like that, right? <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, complete complete garbage like <laughs> rendering, <laughs> yeah. super like yeah, old looking technology. Yeah, but yeah, the character I just think he's he's so funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are there any emergent memes or subcultures that are springing up now that you think might grow into something larger? Yeah, I mean, like, I was kind of thinking that the whole Andrew Yang, Yang gang was going to go somewhere more. It seems to have kind of petered out a little bit. But yeah, so Andrew Yang is this Democratic presidential candidate who, uh, you know, his main platform uh, his position is to get everybody uh, $1,000 a month for as part of his universal basic income income program. He refers to it as like a, a freedom dividend after, you know, he, he went on like the Joe Rogan podcast and uh, I think that was kind of like his big turning point. And then on 4chan, he kind of started like a little bit of like a civil war between Yang gangers and MAGA Trump supporters. And, <laughs> you know, that all these memes about him, you know, getting everybody their thousand dollars a month freedom dividend and, you know, securing the bag, like the the thousand dollars became known as the bag. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, it seemed to have like a little taste of, you know, it's sometimes referred to as like, you know, meme magic 
which is like a colloquial term, which was, you know, a lot of the time it's been used by the, you know, right wing figures when talking about Trump's ascendance. But it, the general term means that, you know, meme magic is kind of like uh, getting a spark of interest in internet culture communities and, and having, you know, quality viral content arise organically. Mm, I yeah. guess the, yeah, that would be a kind of the, the key part of like a meme magic phenomenon would be the organic part of the equation. Yeah. But yeah, I thought, I thought Yang Gang might go somewhere, but we'll see. I mean, maybe with the debates, you'll see Yang pop up again. If he's able to, you know, get people to want that bag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any other subcultures, anything that you, that are emerging at the moment that could grow? Something I've been surprised about too, is just like the power of, um, YouTube creators like PewDiePie and Keemstar and all these people are, their viewership is so high. It seems like it's way more than cable news even at this point. And like these drama, these YouTube drama stories have just become so big. Like the most recent one was this uh, James Charles versus um, Toddy Westbrook feud that took over the, the internet news cycles. And I feel like you know, five years ago, even this wouldn't be nearly as big as it is now. And I think that this kind of like online drama news community has kind of gotten way bigger, at least than I expected. Mm. It seems like it was kind of like a kind of, yeah, maybe a petty drama that is now a huge news story. And like people like, you know, the Paul brothers, like Logan, anything that they do becomes just like such a huge news story. Now it's so weird. And yeah, they're like the new, the new like boy band celebrity type people now. Yeah. All right. Here are the closing questions. This podcast is called The Good Timeline, and that's because we're trying to examine culture and technology and science for insights on how to adapt to the future, because the future is going to get really weird. So, yeah. And already people are finding it difficult to adapt to modern, to the modern world. What do you think will be invaluable skills or traits for humans adapting to the future? I think one of the m most important skills, especially in the internet age, is the ability to kind to uh, evaluate the information that you're consuming for whether or not it's accurate or not. So I think that's a skill that a lot of people are right now are really bad at. I think that a lot of what goes on, and this is not isolated to any particular group, people spread information that is pretty inaccurate, pretty easily to find, pretty easy to find out that it's inaccurate too. For example, I'll, you know, on Facebook for the longest time there, I was seeing, you know, people I knew from like the Burning Man community, for example, posting all kinds of pseudoscience stuff that, you know, they had no evidence to support it. There was something there was like this water experiment I was seeing passed around all the time that had been thoroughly debunked and it was about like sending good intentions to water yeah, and that yeah. it would make plants grow faster or some bullshit. And, and <laughs> yeah. That kind of shit would just spread like wildfire. And there's we also see that now with like people spreading the the whole fake news meme, right? Like people spreading news or information that is clearly inaccurate. If, it, if you just spend, you know, a very small amount of time checking it or even just like looking at the source it's coming from, like some website that, you know, no one's never ever heard of yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is, you know, saying some ridiculous story. I think that that skill is going to become increasingly important. At least I hope it does. Like, I hope it becomes costly to start spreading misinformation without having any social consequences to doing so. I, I hope it becomes uh, costly to, to do that yeah. so that people will be incentivized to actually evaluate something for at least spend the minimum amount of effort to evaluate whether something is, is, is uh, coming from a trustworthy source or not. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great answer. Can you finish the sentence? We're no strangers to love. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the Rick, I know it's the Rick Astley song. I can't remember the lyrics for the life of me right now. Is it, you know the rules, but so do I. Yeah, I can't that's, remember it, the, that's uh, it. Okay, that's okay, it. okay, 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 yeah. Passed. <laughs> it was a test for your, your uh, ultimate meme knowledge, and uh, of course yeah, you passed. Yeah, yeah. That's great. 
Yeah, we don't need to get into the Rick and Roll phenomena. That's uh, that still <laughs> it still lives and is still powerful. I was um, well, half, I was half expecting a a torrented version of Game of Thrones that a friend downloaded to have that halfway through the episode. That would have been pretty funny, but um, no. Yeah, that would have been good. It made the uh, <laughs> we recently had a hall of memes where we inducted you know ten memes from the past two decades into like this hall of hall of fame and, and that rickroll obviously made it in yeah yeah i'm glad to hear it <laughs> <laughs> it never gets old it's still it's still brilliant all right this is the final question if you could inhabit the consciousness of any animal for a day what would it be and why probably an octopus <laughs> because they're my favorite animal <laughs> and, and i think they're really cool i don't know i think it would also be really, really interesting to like experience what an octopus consciousness would be like because they're supposed to have like all these neurons distributed throughout their arms and stuff like that so maybe that would be kind of cool and also like I, i've always been curious like what, the ones that change color a lot to fit into their background like is there any conscious element to that or is that just completely automatic mm. you know and also they're supposed to be like you know reasonably intelligent for an invertebrate so yeah that that's my answer nice it's quite funny because i i recently interviewed uh gold dolan who is from johns hopkins and she gave she and her team gave octopuses mdma and a sort of experiment to figure out whether they have a social reaction to mdma like mammals and then my last guest that I had on, who is Stephen Hill from Hearts of Space, he said he would be a cuttlefish, which is pretty much an octopus um, from the same family. So, yeah, it seems yeah, to be cuttlefish an octopus. are very cool. Yeah, seems to be an octopus sort of uh, theme going on with recent guests, which is kind of kind of fun. I would also like to be a cuttlefish too. That would also be pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wicked man. Well, Don, how can people find you and your work? I'm the managing editor of Know Your Memes, so you can find a lot of the stuff I do on there. And you can find my Twitter uh, at D-O-N-C-A-L-D. Post on there sometimes. Um, I also used to do these more often, but I, I kind of stopped doing them. On YouTube, I sometimes post FPV drone videos. Nice. But uh, my drones are all broken right now, so I haven't done that in a while. But yeah, sometimes I fly racing drones acrobatically for fun in weird locations. So Nice. Yeah. And you had a Tumblr, right, that I stumbled across with some nice trippy GIFs through it. Oh, yeah, I have a tr Tumblr. I have a, that's mostly inactive now, but yeah, I have a lot of weird trippy GIFs on my Tumblr, that's for sure, yeah. <laughs> I kind of used it as a re repository for trippy shit for a while there, yeah. Yeah, I recommend that one. Nice one, dude. Hey, thank you so much for your time, Don. It's been a really, really great conversation. I've, I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, super enjoyable. Thanks for reaching out. It was a lot of fun. No worries, man. Yo, if you've made it this far, you've listened to this whole episode. So thank you very much. And thank you very much for coming along for the ride if you've been following the Cosmic Tortoise podcast, which is now known as the Good Timeline podcast for these last couple of years. If you've been enjoying the episodes and the chats, uh, I would really, really appreciate it if you could take 30 seconds to give us a rating on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, subscribe to us on any of your platforms, rate us on Spotify, or share our episodes. I'm also going to add some crypto links for those of you that are still in the crypto game and still enjoy that space. If you'd like to check out any of the other episodes, you can just search The Good Timeline in any podcast app. You can also go to thegoodtimeline.com where you'll find all the episodes and the show notes archived. Next episode is with my good friends Alex and Quaylen, who are incredible folk musicians based in Prague. They were based in China and performed in China for quite a while, but they got into some trouble and had to leave. So we talk about that on the podcast and about the meaning crisis around the world and music and perform a few songs. So keep an eye out for that and we'll see you next time on The Good Timeline.